All right, let's get this extra class started. Hello, everyone. Hope you're okay. Here by the window, the sun just came out. That's uh, really nice. Um, nice little cool. It's actually nice out. <laughs> like, why are we here in a math class? We should be like walking outside or something. <laughs> Hope you guys are fine. Had a lot of uh, uh, crazy week. So I, you guys uh, saw that email uh, earlier on. I had some people email me, oh, Professor, I'm so sorry. Like, don't worry. I'm not mad at you guys. I just figured that uh, some of you just didn't, you never thought it through. You know, you never realized how, uh, uh, what effect you were having. So I just thought, I, let me just explain to them that, you know, whenever I give instructions, it's not just to give you something to do. There's actually a well thought out reason behind it, like why I ask you to do things a certain way. And it, it's just, you know, I wanted everyone to understand because apparently some people did not understand. Um, so, and, and I didn't think there was any malicious intent. No one was like, screw you, Javon, I'm gonna send you pictures. You know, they just thought, well, you know, Javon just needs to see my work. So what's the difference if I send him a picture versus a PDF? You know, they're not thinking about it. So I wanted people to know, because I just started looking at the uh, the test like late last night into this morning, because this week, I in the past week, I launched like six mock tests and like five real tests. There was a lot of stuff I had to keep my attention on and I didn't have, you know, like uh, time to even look at the submissions until afterwards. And I'm just going through emails and I'm realizing that so many people are sending things all over the place in all these different formats. I'm like, for me to gather all that, it's just going to be, it's, it's really bad. So then I send an email, explained, okay, guys, there is a reason for this, I'm not just trying to be a pain here. I know it's, it's a rough time for everybody, but really, um, there's a reason why I ask you to do things the way I ask you to do it, because when I'm trying to organize everything and streamline everything, um, I have my own programs, my own like repositories that I'm setting things up in, to just keep the conveyor belt going. And whenever a few people are, 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 are out of line, it just, it disrupts the whole process. So I just want you guys to understand. And I know for you guys, this is just one of your classes, it's just a class. And I am just one of your teachers, but you have to understand, Math 212 to me is not one thing. It's like 90 plus things, right? There, there's like a class that I have to prepare, and then I have 90 plus students that I have to keep my eye on and try to make sure they're all learning what I'm supposed to teach them and I can grade all their work and get it back to them in a time. Like there's a lot of things that I want to keep, keep, keep up, right? So uh, uh, I want you guys to know. So when, when you are just, from your perspective, certain instructions might not seem that important. But on the other hand, when it's something that you're doing hundreds of times, it makes a difference. Right, so I have close to 100 students here, and uh, to grade a paper, on average, takes like 15 minutes, maybe. And so, with 100 people, 100 that's 25 hours I'm sitting in a chair to grade one test. So I want you guys to appreciate that. If like 10 or 15 of you are out of line, it easily adds like 10 hours to my to my workload, like easily, right? For by the time I go to all these different sources, collect everything, have things in the wrong format that I now have to combine, put in the right format and upload it to the thing that I wanted it to be. By the time I do that, I could have graded an entire test. So it's, it's really important that you do what you can to kind of just, just uh, 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 get things in, in time. And yes, life happens, things happen, but of course, you still want to make sure that you kind of uh, go with the flow and follow the instructions. So let's say for whatever reason, things just, it, yeah, couldn't work out. And you just, all I can figure out right now is how to send Javon pictures. What you could do is so, something like, hey, I'm sending you these pictures right now just so you can see that I'm not going to write anything extra because you're probably going to be concerned that if I send you another PDF like 10 minutes from now, maybe I filled in something. So you can send pictures with like a note, like I'll follow up with the right format. But some people just send pictures and, and thought that was it. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah, the, the perspective from the student, it's very different. I just wanted you guys to understand my perspective because I think that puts some of the instructions into context. 
Um, so just wanted to look at that. Um, I haven't graded any, I haven't graded any complete tests so far. Normally I grade question at a time. So I, I kind of finished the entire class. Um, yeah, I, thank you, so clear. It, it says caffeine on it and it has the, uh, the chemical thing for caffeine. It's tea in it though, so I don't know if that's uh, blasphemy or whatever. All right, let's, uh, yeah, so read that email. I just mentioned it now because I, I also learned from experience students tend to not read long emails. But it's important, you know, just, just trying to get along with other people. It's important that you kind of not make their lives harder because it comes back to you. Like if, if I'm less efficient grading, it's less efficient for you because you don't get your grades back quick enough. So uh, I have several cups of math equations, but uh, this is the one I'm using now. The one with math equations, I normally put coffee in it. So this one with caffeine, I put tea in it. I don't know. All right. Um, yeah. So, uh, that being said, let's actually jump into it. Share screen. So now you guys see this, I am going to stop the video and we can get into the plan for the day. So as I said, I'm just going to get through what I plan to get through. Um, if any of you want to actually stay back towards the end, maybe to ask me questions about the exam. Um, I, I can probably spare a few minutes for that. Um, so these are the notes that I gave for the RS2 section, but we're actually doing this for both right now. So I only pulled up the RS2 section because that was the later lecture that I gave, but this is actually something for both classes. It's continuing both classes. You're both at the same spot right now. So I can just kind of pick up where I left off uh, for both classes. So uh, we started talking about the topic cylinders cylinders and quadric surfaces. And the main goal of this section is to help you learn to graph things in 3D, draw three-dimensional graphs of certain equations, of surfaces, et cetera, right? And we are in particular looking at cylinders and quadric surfaces. These are very specific types of, um, um, these are very specific types of uh, surfaces. So a cylinder, there's a very technical definition that I brought here, but you can just think of it as taking one curve like you, you see here, this red curve, and just moving it along an axis. And if you just map out the, 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 all the points in space that, is, is, is at, that you hit by moving it along some axis, you create what's called a cylinder. Now, if you cut a cross section, if you slice into that thing orthogonal to the axis, you'll always see the same curve. This curve is called the generating curve. Um, so when you want to sketch a cylinder, uh, you would just sketch the generating curve and then you kind of extend that along the axes. Now, uh, a couple important things here. How do you know that you're looking at a cylinder? I wanna go over that. So you know you're looking at a cylinder if the equation that you want to graph only has two variables in it. So there will be a missing variable. Okay, so that, that's an important thing. A cylinder, there will be a missing variable. So if here I see y equals x squared, that is a cylinder. x squared plus z squared equals one, that is a cylinder. Um, if I see something like x squared plus y squared minus z squared equals one, that is not a cylinder because it has three variables in it. Now, the only exception to this is that of planes. You can think about a plane as a, a strange type of cylinder. Your generating curve is actually just a line. Um, so those guys can have one or three variables in them and they are still technically a cylinder. But once we're not looking at a planar cylinder, it's not like completely flat, uh, it will have a missing variable. So looking at the equation and seeing that there are only two variables, you can identify it as a cylinder. Now, the next thing you'd want to know is the axis. And the nice thing about the equation of a cylinder is the missing variable will tell you what the axis is. So I did an example here of, the, of sketching this equation. Now we see that this was an ellipse uh, because we have to remember that that's an ellipse from our conic sections lecture. And so I could sketch that in 2D, but knowing that this is a cylinder because there's only two variables, there's an X and a Z, the Y is missing. Um, I know that that's going to be this curve, the ellipse is going to be stretched along an axis. And so 
to figure out what axis it's stretched along, I simply have to figure out who's the missing variable, which is y. So it means that this curve is going to be extended along the y-axis. It will be moving parallel to the y-axis the whole time, right? So uh, those are some important things. So I guess there are three important things when it comes to a cylinder. And the last of these is also important when you're sketching anything that's not a cylinder even. Um, so a cylinder, as long as it's not a plane, will have an equation with only two variables in it. There will be a missing variable. That's the first thing that's very important for you to know. So if you're taking your own notes, that's one of the things I would write down. It, it, I mentioned it in here, uh, but if you want to do some quick bullet points of things you really want to know, that's one of the things that I would write down. A cylinder will only have two variables in its equation. The next thing that you'd want to write down for a cylinder is the missing variable tells you the axis that you're parallel to. So if the y is missing, it means that the axis that you're stretching the cylinder along is parallel to the y-axis. If the x is missing, then it's parallel to the x-axis and so on and so forth. And I, I gave you some examples down here, as you can see. Here, the y was missing. I have a parabola stretched along the y. Here, the z is missing. I have a circle stretched along the z. Here, the x is missing. I have a hyperbola stretched along the x. Right, so the missing variable tells you the, the axis that you're parallel to. So that's the second important thing that you'd want to know for a cylinder. The third important thing that you'd want to know for a cylinder is just, you need to be good at sketching curves in 2D in general. So the missing, uh, the equation of the cylinder, it will have a form that should be recognizable to you. So here, I realize that those are just, that's an equation in two variables, so I know it's a cylinder, but then I'd have to figure out, well, what kind of equation that is? And by remembering our lecture on uh, conic sections, you would realize that that particular example really fit uh, this mold right here, right? It looks like that, okay? So just by you knowing about the two-dimensional uh, ellipse, helps you identify that generating curve and how to sketch it. I know this is an ellipse because this is, the, this is the form that I wrote in green. That's the form of an ellipse that we can see from the conic sections lecture, right? So the center is zero comma zero, which is this num the, the number that is x minus zero and z minus zero. And then the denominator of the x is three squared, which means you have stretch three and three in the x direction. The denominator of the z is one squared, which is stretch one and one in the z direction. And you connect those dots, that gives you the ellipse. Now the missing variable is y, so that tells you you take this ellipse and you extend it along the y-axis, right? If the center was not the origin, you would still extend it along something parallel to the y-axis. So either way, right, so, so if, the, if, the, if it, the center was up here, you'd still extend it along something that's parallel to the y-axis, so that's, that's important. Um, but yeah. But you will also, the third thing, you need to remember how to sketch things in 2D in general. So remember how to sketch your parabolas. Remember how to sketch your circles. Remember how to sketch your hyperbolas. Remember how to sketch your ellipses. Remember how to sketch everything. Remember how to sketch a straight line. Remember how to sketch every curve that we've taught you to sketch in 2D. Because oftentimes sketching in 3D comes down to you first sketching in 2D and then kind of extending that in some uh, predictable way. Okay, so you do need to be good with your 2D sketches. So if you kind of just glossed over the conic sections lecture, I actually put a bonus on this in the, in the test, and I did it for a reason. Uh, if you glossed over your conic sections lecture, you need to go back, you need to learn those curves, you need to make sure you know how to draw them because you will be completely lost. Um, and sketching is important in general, and I will pro probably talk about that in, in a bit. Like, uh, is it possible to survive one of these calculus classes without sketching? Well, if a question specifically asks you to sketch, then yes, you're definitely going to lose some points. But I'd be lying if I didn't say yes. You could potentially pass Calc 2 and Calc 3 without knowing how to sketch a thing. Um, but your life will be many, many, many times harder than it has to be. It's much easier to just know how to sketch these curves. And it'll, it'll actually be a lot more efficient to get through a lot of different problems. And when you get to higher classes, Calc 3 um, or something like Math 392 or differential equations, you'll realize that sometimes you can't even start a problem unless you know what the object looks like that you're trying to do the problem on. 
So being able to sketch is very important. So those are the three highlights for cylinders. Um, you know you're looking at a cylinder if the equation only has two variables in it. The second important point is that the missing variable tells you the axis that you're stretching along. You'll always stretch along an axis that is parallel to that one. And third, you need to know how to sketch things in 2D very well. You need to be able to recognize what graph you're looking at in 2D and be able to sketch it very quickly. Um, and then with a cylinder, you just stretch it along the axis and you're, you're golden. And I gave you some examples of a cylinder here and we actually sketched the example of a cylinder there last time. So the next thing we wanted to talk about is quadric surfaces and that's, those are these guys right here. Um, so a quadric surface, the mathematical definition is going to be like any curve that looks like this. But through rotation of axes, you can eliminate these uh, terms here with two variables. And by completing the square, you can combine these terms with one variables with their co corresponding squares. And you can rewrite them in this form right here. So you can get them to be in that standard form. You don't need to worry about that. Uh, chances are we will give you the equation in this nice form. So it would look something like this. So you'll notice that this kind of matches up with that because your A is like one over A squared, your B is like one over B squared, your C is like one over C squared. And in this case, your J would be minus one. And that will give you this equation right here. And so for different choices of A, B, C, and J, you will get one of these six kinds of equations here, right? So unlike cylinders where there was an infinite variety to worry about, like I can give you any generating curve and it will generate its own cylinder. Quadric surfaces are a little bit easier in the sense that there are really only six types of things that you really need to know how to sketch. And these are those six things. In the upper left corner, we have what's called an ellipsoid. And you can realize that when you slice through an ellipsoid, at, every, at any given slice, uh, perpendicular to one of the axes, uh, you will see an ellipse. Now, of course, if your A, B, and C are all equal, the ellipse becomes a circle and the ellipsoid becomes a sphere, but you get kind of idea. You, if you slice it, you'll see circles and ellipses. Then we have uh, the cone. So conic sections uh, comes in handy here because you realize that if you slice it in one direction, you'll see like an ellipse or a circle, um, but in general, you'll have that. We have the elliptic paraboloid. So that's this kind of shape right here. Uh, we have the hyperboloid of one sheet. We have the hyperboloid of two sheet. This guy comes from us combining hyperbolas in a nice way uh, to create these guys. And then you have the hyperbolic paraboloid. That guy you get by, it's a combination of parabolas and hyperboloids. So that's why it's called a hyperbolic paraboloid. If you look for slice in one direction, you'll see parabolas. If you slice in another direction, you'll see hyperbolas. And I'm, I'll talk about how to actually generate these guys uh, pretty soon. But you will need to know how to draw these six types of things. And I'm going to teach you how to draw these six types of things. Um, I will say, for the record, the hyperboloids of one or two sheets, traditionally speaking, they don't show up very commonly on tests. But then again, with the final being online on Blackboard, that will probably change. You'll probably have questions where you have to match equations to the surfaces that they generate. And it'll, it'll be easy to just throw in one of these guys in there. So you, I, I would say you still should know them. Um, so in general, my advice would be, yeah, you can ignore these two over here, but we'll, we'll still go over them just in case. Um, but ellipsoids and, and paraboloids and cones and hyperbolic paraboloids, uh, and, and you really need to know those and we'll actually go through those. Again, the trick here, so, uh, the important points for the quadric surfaces, these six types of things here. So I told you all the important things for cylinders. The important things for these guys right here is the following. One, you need to, again, be able to sketch things in 2D very well, specifically conic sections, right? So specifically what, what leads to all of these guys, all their slices, these cross sections that we look at, they will be conic sections. So the conic sections lecture is very important here. Um, so you'll see that when we start to put them together. Two, um, you need to be able to put together several, you're not gonna be extending along an axis anymore. That's how you call it, create a cylinder. And these guys, you'll notice they will have three variables in them. They won't be cylinders. But uh, 
you need to be able to combine several two-dimensional graphs into this three-dimensional surface. And I'll talk about that, uh, how to do that uh, presently. So let me kind of show you how we're going to do it. This is used uh, when we sketch a 3D figure using a bunch of 2D figures, we say we've used traces. So the 2D graphs, these are called the traces of the graph. Technically, uh, this graph here, you can call it a trace for the cylinder here. But we usually don't use trace for cylinders. We usually call these guys generating curves. But we will use curves like this to generate the pictures for these quadric surfaces. And these guys, these pictures that we generate, they are called traces. So what are traces? The traces are the 2D graphs that we will use to put together to get the 3D graph. And you might say, well, how do I get the 2D graph? Well, I'm glad you asked, uh, proverbial student. You will get the 2D graphs by actually plugging in a constant for one of these variables at a time. So for example, we look at this equation here. First thing I should note is I know it's not a cylinder. How do I know it's not a cylinder? It has three variables and it's not a plane. Cylinders that are not planes do not have three variables. So that's the first thing. So I know this isn't a cylinder. I know it's something else. So how do I go about doing that? Well, I'm going to use a bunch of 2D sketches to help me out. And how do I generate these 2D sketches? Well, I plug in one variable equal a constant at a time, right? And that will leave two other variables to worry about. Now, whenever I do this, you say I have formed a trace. So let's look at some traces for these guys and try to actually uh, see what they would give us. So here, let's do some traces. So how does a trace work? I'm gonna go here and I'm going to plug in one variable equals a constant at a time. Now the constant that you plug in will vary. You just plug in one that's kind of convenient. So for example, let's say I plug in Z equals zero, which means I am in the X, Y plane. Okay. Now if Z equals zero, the curve becomes X squared over four plus Y squared over nine equals one. And what is that equation? What is that the equation of? That's good. That's an ellipse, right? And in fact, we know it's kind of stretched along the Y. So it's an ellipse that's elongated like this way, right? So this is an ellipse. Now the X, it stretches two units in the X and it stretches three units in the Y. Right? But I recognize that in his ellipse. This here, this curve that I just drew is called a trace. Okay? So it's just a 2D, it's one 2D perspective of the three dimensional graph. And I can go to another one. I can say sketch x equals zero. This will give me the graph y squared over nine plus z squared equals one. And you'll notice that is also an ellipse. So now you need to know how to sketch that ellipse. So here, I'm going to sketch that in the y, z plane. So this goes, again, stretches along the, the y. It stretches three units in the y direction, but only one unit in the z direction. Now I'm going to sketch, uh, say, y equals zero. Now if I sketch y equals zero, this becomes the graph uh, x squared over four plus z squared equals one. Again, that's an ellipse. So now if I plot in the XZ, uh, that would be stretching along the X. So that here will be stretching two in the X direction and one in the Z direction. So here I've drawn three different perspectives. Now, let's move this, this guy here. We're gonna sketch all of these today. Give me some more space here. Is that enough space? Hopefully it is. So now I have three different uh, points of view when it comes to this one curve. So all of these I'm going to put together and I'm going to uh, get a curve, which we are going to have. Now we're going to draw in three space.
And now I'm thinking I should have made these maybe different colors. I don't know if I can make it a different color. Yes, let's make that one green. And uh, let's make this one blue. Sorry to anyone out there who may be colorblind. I know blue and green. <laughs> you can't, like, you, can, you can't help it. Like, hopefully you just pay attention and you, you'll get what I'm talking about. All right, so um, let's go. What we would do is we would go and we would actually sketch this guy on top of, uh, in the 3D sphere. So this is the negative X. Back there goes the negative Y. Right here goes the negative Z. So you go one at a time. So now let's sketch the first one. In the XY plane, I know that this is uh, an ellipse and it stretches more along the, towards the X than it does the Y. So in the XY plane, there's going to be an ellipse on the floor stretching like that. So it touches here at three, touches down here at minus three, touches right here at two, touches right here at minus two. But you can imagine that this is flat on the floor, right? So uh, I think I have what flipped. Oh yes, I do have that flipped. It was three on the Y. Oh, God, one of us is paying attention. Okay, so let's go again. It's actually elongated along the Y. So it, it was three, it stretched this way. Okay, so. Three minus three two minus two. Okay, so that's the, the first one. So we have to sketch this on the floor. Now you look at the x equals zero. Well, that of course would be in the yz plane and it's another ellipse that it stretches on the y. So we're imagining that's in the wall and I kind of, uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, about the xz plane and the yz plane and all that good stuff, you need to go back to the lecture that we did on the 3D a uh, coordinate system where this describes what I'm talking about. So the first curve is in the X, uh, Y plane. The second curve I'm drawing now is in the Y, Z plane. And the, I'm going to draw the thing in the X, Z plane. Okay. So we actually talked about that earlier. So now I'm going to draw this curve in the, in the Y, Z plane. So again, uh, it's an ellipse where it cuts the Y at three. It'll go up, cut the Z at two come back, cut the Y at three, and come back. Now these two curves, they actually are orthogonal to each other, right? One is in the, uh, one is in the X, Y plane, and the other one is in the Y, Z plane. And then now uh, I'm going to sketch this last one here. This here is in the X, Z plane. So I'm gonna create this blue and I'm going to actually draw that curve. Now this will touch, uh, the Z should be one, not two. This is minus one and one. Okay, now I'm going to draw the blue. So it's going to do this. It's going to come up, it's going to touch the one, it's going to go down, it's going to touch the two, it's going to go under, it's going to touch the one, it's going to come under like that, right? Now, all of these guys are in different plane. They're, they're like orthogonal to each other. Um, and now our 3D figure, what is that? Well, now you kind of just imagine that these curves just kind of spin on their axes. They like, so this green curve just whirls around like that and the red curve just whirls around like that and the blue curve is whirls around like that, and they all come together. And they form an ellipsoid. Okay. 
And we now just actually drew. Uh... Oh, you just realized? <laughs> okay, so, uh, so let's see some questions here. Do you actually need all three planes? Um, no, you and and there are times. This this is a loaded question because you kind of need as many as you need. Like you draw enough traces to figure out what you're looking at. There are times when you'll need more than three curves, and there are times when you won't necessarily choose the x y plane or the y z plane. Sometimes going in x equals zero is not convenient. You might have to choose x equals one or x equals five or some other constant. Um, so you pretty much pick what is the most convenient to you. Now, in a lot of situations, just setting one variable equal to zero happens to be the most convenient thing, but it's not always the most convenient thing. Um, you just really pick enough points of view for you to kind of understand what the object would look like when you kind of put them together. So here I just showed you how we would come and put this together. Now for an ellipsoid, Putting three curves together is enough in general. You'll kind of know what that is. Um, and then eventually, when you sketch enough of these, you'll just know that's an ellipsoid right off the bat, and you'll actually be able to skip drawing traces, right? So for those of you who want to know when you've arrived, if you want to know, am I ready for the final? Am I ready for this type of problem? Well, how you know you're ready for the sketching part of the exam is to be able to draw these things without actually doing the traces first. Like it is possible to get to the point where you can just like, you can immediately go to the 3D version and you can even sketch the traces on the 3D version if you have to, and you can actually kind of figure it out. Like I could, um, like if I saw, like what was the equation here? So it's actually copying back here. So eventually you want to get to the point where you can see that equation and you can immediately go to the, the 3D version. Uh, X, Y, Z. Like you can put your finger over this and just say, oh, and, and that's an ellipse. And then you kind of draw it on the, the X, Y plane. And then you put your thumb over the Y and then you realize, oh, that's, that's also like an ellipse. And you put that in the X, Z plane. And then you cover your thumb over uh, the X and you're like, oh, that's another ellipse that comes da, da, da. And then you can kind of just put those guys together right on the spot, right? And you'd realize that that is your object here, right? So eventually you'll get so good that you'll be able to draw these guys without traces. And you'll, you'll know at that point that, yeah, I, I got this graphing thing down. I'm so good. I don't need these three points of view. Um, but I can just like jump right to the graph and start graphing it. Um, yeah, you do want to mark a coordinates. Now, you don't have to do that whole thing that students like to do and write the notches, like counting up three marks to get to the three. You just pick a random point, call it three, and then just kind of base all the other coordinates uh, based on that, relatively speaking, right? Okay, so um, that's overall, that's the process. Now, um, we are going to do this process over and over for all these guys right here. And unfortunately, this is one of those things that it's really nice to do in a class because then I can, uh, you know, point to people and I can have them. What do you think this is gonna look like? And you guys all draw traces in the air with your fingers and I'll have fun at guessing what you're trying to sketch. Um, but for the most part now, you guys are just going to be watching me sketch. <laughs> watching me sketch. Um, <laughs> Cause yeah, yeah, I, I'm tempted to have some of you turn on your webcams and just try to <laughs> try to sketch some things out in the air. But I don't, I don't even want, <laughs> David's down. <laughs> At this point, I just, 
you know, with technology, I don't want to actually push the envelope here and just have a bunch of people sharing their screens. I, I just, I feel like if I do that stuff's going to go wrong. Um, so yeah, for the most part, you guys are going to sit here and kind of watch me sketch these things, but, uh, definitely, uh, you do want to, uh, Sure, you guys can turn your mic on and then just kind of shout out what I'm, I'm going to do. So like if, if I'm drawing the traces, you guys can shout to me like what you think the trace is. Like, like we can do that. I'll, I'll be fine with that. Um, but for the most part, you guys are just going to watch me sketch a bunch of stuff. And I'm going to trust you to go home and sketch more stuff for your homework and, and look in the textbook and sketch more stuff to try to try to nail the process down. So the problems here, it's a mixture of cylinders and quadric surfaces. So you, we will be doing all the other ones. Uh, so. Hey, Kevin, if I can show myself my haircut, you can too. Like, I've, you know, before this whole quarantine thing happened, I, 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 said, to my, I, I said to myself, you know what, I should probably get a haircut. <laughs> like, if they're actually serious and shut everything down, I think the barbers are gonna shut down too. Like, I had that thought. But yeah, I, di I didn't follow, I didn't follow through. Anyway, let's actually go. Uh, y, Z equals Y squared, what kind of thing is that? It's a cylinder, how do you know it's a cylinder? It's missing a, it's missing a variable. Okay, so now your head looks like something. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm about at the point where I'm going to probably shave my whole head too. Okay, so this here, you see two variables, which means cylinder, right? So that's the first thing I notice. Then I notice that the X is missing. So I know axis is parallel to x-axis. So now I want to then, I want to look at the generating curve. So this would be like me drawing in the yz plane. And of course the generating curve is going to be a parabola. So now I'm going to actually look at the sketch. And I'm going to put that in, in, in 3D. And this kind of goes back there, and this kind of goes back there, and this kind of goes down there. And so now I realize I'm uh, sketching that generating curve. So there's like uh, this, Probably here. But then I kind of stretch that along the axes. And so we pretty much have. Uh, some guy that looks like this. Okay. And that's the cylinder. Uh, this is Z equals Y squared. It looks like this. And it's stretching along the X. Um, so you think I drew Y equals Z squared as opposed to Z equals Y squared? Well, I mean, if we looked at y equals x squared, right? If the y is on the vertical and the x is here, that looks like this, right? So if I had z equals y squared, just put y in the place of x, z in the place of y, the curve would look like that. So it's opening up on the, on the z, 
and then I know it's stretching along the X. Yeah. Okay, so that's the that's the first that's the first one. Let's look at this one. What kind of curve? Cylinder again, Y is missing. So I know it's just going to be some cylinder stretching along. Uh, so here, Y missing. That guy gives me axis. And I know cylinder. So now I look at, and again, the generating curve is something that you don't really need to draw a trace for the generating curve. Um, you could actually draw it like this red mark on the 3D plane and just, just run with it. But let me just do the, the, the sketching the generating curve first. Generating curve. So here it is just x squared plus z squared equals four. So put the x here, put the z here, and that is a circle. A circle of radius two. And so this means our sketch Well, I'm just going to have like a circle of radius two uh, on the XZ plane. But then that is running along the Y. And this really runs forever in all directions. So I, don't, I know it looks like I'm sort of slicing it off here, but unless you're told that it stops at a certain point, it really goes on forever. So that is a cylinder. It's, it's kind of this object that I have up here, except it's running along the y-axis instead. And this one, again, it's a cylinder. I know here, Z missing. Uh, and so this guy here is the axis. And then I know it's a cylinder. So this one here, we would call it, uh, the sketch here is called a circular cylinder because it's circle. And this up here would be called a parabolic cylinder because it's a parabola. And here, this is going to be a cylinder and you'll notice that it is the equation of ellipse. So this is an elliptic cylinder. And a circular cylinder is just a special case of an elliptic cylinder, kind of like how a square is a special case of a rectangle. Um, so, so you'll call it an elliptic cylinder. And so again, I can draw the generating curve, which again, uh, when you get good enough, you can actually skip this step eventually. Um, but for now, let's just keep it going. Um, here it's stretched more in the Y than in the X. So it's like that. It stretches three units in the Y and two units in the X. And so, um, in fact, let's kind of make this a little. So now I can do the sketch in uh, three dimensions. Now, since the missing axis, the missing variable is the Z, I know that I would have something running up along the Z axis. What would I have running up along the Z axis? Well, something that looks like this. 
and then it's running up. And so I have a bunch of loops like this. You kind of put it all together. And it's it's hollow, but it extends forever, keeps going up. But you kind of now have some of that kind of looks like a, a circular cylinder, but it's kind of stretched more in one direction than in the other. So you get that. Leaning tower of Pete. All right. Uh, so what kind of cylinder is this one? It's not a cylinder. <laughs> Good. I was going to see who, who said it, and then I would like throw a virtual chalk through. OK, so let's actually figure this one out, because we haven't actually seen this kind of curve yet. Or surface is the, the more. Um... Now, would it be an ellipsoid? So now there are a couple reasons why you wouldn't think of it as an ellipsoid. Um, not a sphere either. So sphere, remember we looked at that, that look, should look like x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals r squared. Okay, so you guys wanna like take a screenshot of this or something? I don't know. So an ellipsoid, remember you have to have traces of ellipse. So you need to have a one in some position and the, the, all the other variables are squared. Because you need to be able to like plug in zero for one of them and you have a sum of squares with a one on the other side, right? If you don't have a one, that's fine. You just divide the entire equation by whatever constant you have up here to make it a one. And then as long as it's non-zero, you would do that. OK, so uh, let's actually figure this guy out by doing the whole traces thing. So because the z is not squared, I know it's not going to be a sphere. And for a sphere, they all need to be positive on the other side and a constant on the other side. So what I would do is let's talk about traces. So let's say I trace uh, x equals 0. So this means I want to draw z equals y squared. Well, that's a parabola. So if the z is here and the y is here, it will open along the z. And what if I trace y equals 0? That means I have z equals x squared. That's another parabola. Uh, let's do that in a different color. That's like that. And this is here, z is on this axis. Uh, and now let's say I put, uh, say, z equals 0. So I get x squared plus y squared equals 0. Now, what's, what's that? x squared plus y squared equals 0. What is that a sketch of? It's just a point, because the only, play, the only way for that to work is for x and y to be only 0. So this here, not very useful, is it? Right? It just tells you a point. I mean, it is somewhat useful, but it doesn't really give you a curve that can give you a lot of information. So maybe something else? Right, you can choose z equals 1. If I were to choose z equals 1, that is x squared plus y squared equals 1. And now you realize that generates a circle of radius 1. But then you can imagine that z equals k at any point. 
And you'll realize that, oh, as long as k is not zero, that generates a circle of square root k. So I know that on the z levels, on things parallel to the y, x, y plane, I'm getting circles. So now, OK, I can. Th this is usable. Uh, I should probably put these circles in like a, a different color. Let's make them blue. All right, so this is actually usable. Um, let's put this together towards a sketch. So here we go to the three. I uh, don't, don't really like that line. Here we go to the 3D. Da, 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 da. Negative Z, X, da, 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 da. negative Y. Da, 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 da. Negative Z. All right, let's put these guys together. Let's put the red one first. So Z equals Y squared. So this is in the Y, Z plane, and that is a problem. Okay, let's do the other one, the green, z equals x squared. So that's another problem. Now it's actually in a plane that's orthogonal to the first problem. I don't like that. Now I realize that the blues Slice so the other way. The first one gave me a point at the origin, but then when I moved up to a level of one, it gave me a circle of radius one. If I had moved up to a level of four, it would give me a circle of radius two. And then I moved up more, I just get like circles every time I'm slicing this way. Right? So now you see, ah, try to put these guys together. And it generates something that looks like that. I actually don't like how the top looks, but whatever. Right? We get a paraboloid. We get this guy right here, an elliptic paraboloid. Now, technically, this one is a circular paraboloid because the A equals B. So the slicing uh, is circles. But now, oh. Okay, so we have uh, something like that. It does look like a basket. So, uh, Jesse, ooh, I, I, I wonder if you did, I don't know if Jesse had a, her eureka moment just now, how we kind of put things together, but yeah. So hopefully you're seeing, especially when you're just starting out, first of all, you need to really be able to identify 2D sketches very well. I need to know immediately, oh, I need to look at a, it's a parabola from this perspective. It circles from this perspective. Notice here when we plugged in, and this was something that I mentioned earlier that we, we, we're now getting back to. Sometimes just plugging in one of the variables equals zero isn't going to give you enough information. So then you plug in some other constant and hopefully you can get more information from that. So I realized if I plugged in z equals one, I would get a, a, a circle of radius one. Z equals two would give me a circle of radius radical two and so on and so forth. So the z equals constant at a different levels of z, I get circles. Now, of course, you can also notice that I couldn't actually pick a negative constant here. So uh, I would have to, of course, have k greater than zero for it to make any sense. The sum of squares will never actually be negative. And that's why our picture doesn't have a bottom part. It only has a top part. So I know that this, these, I, th these traces that I have up here are, are, all the, are all the traces I would need to kind of figure out what this thing looks like in 3D. And so we have that.
do this. So now we're, we're, we're pretty much coming up on a time that would ordinarily represent, I don't know what happened, whatever I just did on do. I think this, let me, let me close and reopen this. So we're pretty much coming up on a time that would. Uh, no, no, never mind. Uh, we didn't start at four. We started at four thirty. Okay. So we're about an hour in. I, either way, I think I do kind of want to almost rush through these others here, um, which I think it's. Uh, which I think it's fine. I mean, you guys are watching me sketch these things anyway. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna sketch the rest of these and uh, I'm just gonna talk through it while I'm doing it. Um, I'll check the chat box every now and then if there are any questions that you wanna stop me. But I'm, I'm just gonna pretty much go uh, sketch these, uh, talk through what's going through my head while I'm sketching them and hopefully that would be that would be good enough and then we can uh move on so let's actually do this so here e let's look at e so traces now e is actually very similar to the last one by the way uh if i let x equals zero i get z equals four y squared that is a parabola as well it's just a little thinner one. If I let y equals zero, I get z equals x squared. That's also a parabola in the xz. And if I let uh, z equals zero, I realize it isn't going to give me anything meaningful. So let's go like z equals one. So here I have x squared plus four uh, y squared. Let's do z equals four. Equals four. I divide both sides by four. I would get x squared over four plus y squared equals one. I know that's an ellipse um, where the x is stretched two in the x and one in the y. So then I come down. Uh, I want to do my general sketch. And now I just kind of put these together. So in the uh, XZ plane and XY plane, I have uh, parabolas, but they're kind of stretched more along the X way direction than in the Y direction. So it look like uh, something like this, something like that. Then I realized when I slice uh, at Z equals one, it kind of elongates more in like this, along z equals four, like, the, like that. So, it'll be like that. And it's an elliptic paraboloid, right? But it, it's kind of stretched uh, in the x more than it is in the y. So it's very similar to this, which is a circular parabola. Slices across our circles, 
here slices across are ellipses, which are more stretched in the x direction than in the in the y direction. And of course, it keeps going up forever. Okay. And of course, you can realize that that would be the case because this you can write as z equals x squared over one squared plus y squared over a half squared. And so it stretches one unit in the x, but it only stretches half as far in the y proportionally at any given point. So you will be stretched more in that direction. Um, F. Now this one here should be a fun one uh, because this one is going to be, uh, you can essentially think of this as the equation of a Pringles potato chip. I don't know if kids still eat that these days. Um, but uh, yeah, so let's actually see this one. Uh, the mathematical name for this is a, uh, not Pringles potato chip, but what is a Pringles potato chip? Uh, it's it's a hyperbolic paraboloid. So if you ever ask someone, hey, pass a can of hyperbolic paraboloids over there. They're, they're asking you for a Pringles potato chip, just in case. You know, you might have a nerdy friend who would say something like that at some point. Um, anyway, <laughs> it's funny, Jessie's like, LOL, question mark. She doesn't even know if she should be laughing or not. <laughs> or she's like, oh my God, I've said that. Yeah. If you said that, without a doubt, you're the nerd in your friend group, okay? Like, no one will call a Pringles potato chip hyperbolic paraboloids, but technically it is. Technically that surface is a hyperbolic paraboloid. Let's actually do the traces. Now, if I let y equals zero, I would get z equals x squared. That, you'll notice, is a parabola, where if the z is pointing up, it opens towards the z. If your x equals zero, you would get z equals minus y squared. Now that's also a parabola. However, it opens down away from the z. Now remember, these two graphs are orthogonal to each other. They're actually not in the same plane. So from one perspective, it's opening up. From another perspective, it's opening down, which at first should cause some confusion if you've never seen this before. Now you'll notice that if you say something like x equals zero, you will have something like x squared minus y squared equals zero. This will mean that your x is equal to plus or minus y. This will give you a shape like this, but it's actually surprisingly not useful, right? This goes back to one of those things that we had in the conic sections, our, uh, when we did the conic sections, where something was a degenerate conic. This is one of those degenerate conics. You, you actually don't, you're not gonna see this part in the graph very much. So here, what you would instead do, because you have the conic sections uh, uh, table memorized, you kind of remember, uh, what if the z was one? That gives you x squared minus y squared equals one. That is something that you should recognize. Now that is a hyperbola. It opens along the x. So now, what the heck is this thing that has a bunch of parabolas and hyperbolas in it? Now, one thing, you can go back to that table and realize the only thing you know that combines hyperbolas and parabolas is the hyperbolic paraboloid. So you know that that's the graph that it should look like. But how would we actually put that together? Like, how do you know how to sketch that without even memorizing that table? So you have all these traces, and this kind of hints to you that it's a hyperbolic parabola. We have a bunch of parabolas and hyperbolas. So Maybe I should do that thing where I do these different colors. So let's make this uh, green. Let's make this blue. And now let's actually put that together on a sketch. So, All right, so we have boom, boom, boom. 
boom. Negative x goes that way. Negative y goes that way. Negative z goes that way. All right, let's start to put these guys together. Let's uh, start with this uh, parabola over here. Uh, z equals x squared, so that is in the xz plane. And it's going up, z equals x squared. So we have that. All right, now, Hyperbolic paraboloids are definitely the annoying cousin of the quadratic surfaces. I feel like hyperbolic paraboloids are the annoying cousin in the paraboloid family. Like, you know, Thanksgiving, when all the paraboloids are around, the hyperbolic paraboloid, it's just too hyper. Like, too many things is going on in his life all the time. Everyone, like, has, like, normal stories. Oh, you know, the kids and work. Hyperbolic paraboloid comes in like, oh, man, this happened and that happened. And that. Like, how does so many things happen in one person's life? Okay, uh, so let's actually put these two together. So now let's do the green one, the, that upside down, z equals minus y squared. So again, this is in another plane other than that one here. Now we go up and we do the hyperbola. And let's say we're at a level of z equals one. This would meet th this. There comes a point where the parabola is also at the point one. So there's going to be a point here where it's going to meet that, and it's going to open like so. And then you're going to have that open like so. And now you're kind, hopefully you're kind of seeing how these are all going to fit together, stitch together. So now uh, you can do the black. It's going to be like this coming down along here, coming back up, and then going around like that, and then cutting like here. So it's kind of like a saddle, right? But you're at the point where if you slice across here, you see hyperbolas. If you're standing on the y-axis and looking on the xz plane, you see a parabola. But then it swoops down on this way. So if someone was sitting in a saddle, their legs would go over where the green part is. So we have these upside down parabolas on that perspective, but the front and back of the person would be where the upward opening parabolas are. And then on the sides, you have these things. And now normally, uh, if you have something that looks like this, um, and it, it's like boom, 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 boom. Normally, you can kind of uh, sort of cut out this part of the graph here. And then if you draw that by itself, it would kind of look like a, a Pringles potato chip. Right? And so it's just, uh, just cutting out a part of that thing. But this is a hyperbolic paraboloid. That's how we kind of put it together. So a Pringles potato chip is a hyperbolic paraboloid, just in case. That, that's probably one of those things that might show up on a trivia show one day. Like if you're on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? <laughs> and they'll, they'll put like all of these problems there. Like what is the shape of a Pringles potato chip? Is it a doo doo doo, an ellipsoid, or a cone, or a hyperboloid of one sheet? Hyperbolic paraboloid. And then you're going to be like, Damn it, I knew we did this in two on two. Can I phone a friend? Call up Javon in the middle of the night. What's up? I'm trying to do an online test here. What's going on? Hey, you remember when you told us? Okay, I'm going along too much with this fantasy. Let's actually continue here. Let's look at that guy. Now, this guy is super important. You also do want to know this is, there comes a point where some of these are going to be. Um, so commonly coming up in problems that you would should know what they are automatically. This is one of those equations. Z squared equals X squared plus Y squared. It is a cone. It's one of those things that you should know automatically. In fact, 
you should know that the slant of this cone is at 45 degrees away from the axis. Once you have like z, one z squared equals one x squared plus one y squared, it actually gives you a cone where if you were to slice it uh, from the side view, uh, it will give you pi over four at the axis. And something like that is going to be very important for you to know. There's gonna come a point when you're doing spherical coordinates and you want to do a cone in spherical coordinates and then your professor is going to be like, oh, your phi is going to go from zero to pi over four. And a lot of the class is going to be confused, but you guys aren't going to be confused because you are going to remember that Javon said, oh, this is because it opens up at uh, pi over four. Um, now you could do the calculations at that point and figure it out, but uh, it's nice to just actually know it. So let's actually, uh, do that. Uh, this thing is messing up again. Let me erase ya. So how do you figure out this is a cone? Well, you go through and you draw your traces. So, uh, you would do something like, now here, this is one of the rare exceptions where, um, again, if you set y equals zero or x equals zero or, or z equals zero, these guys happen to not be useful. But there's one set, but the set of z equals k, where k is not zero, um, these guys happen to be insanely useful. So for example, if you set z equals one, you'll realize that you have x squared plus y squared equals one squared. And that is just a circle of radius one in the xy plane. And if you set z equals two, you get x squared plus y squared equals four. So that is another circle. Now, of course, if you set z equals zero in the xy plane, you get x equals plus or minus y. And this one is, uh, and this one is somewhat useful. This one is what allows you to see nicely that the angle is going to be pi over four, because you know about this here. That's uh, 45 degrees here. So you, you'd kind of know that. Um, but now you kind of put these together in a sketch and you just realize what's happening is at every level of Z, you just have a circle of that radius. So here's your X, Y, here's your Z. So when Z equals zero, you have a circle of radius zero. When Z equals one, you have a circle of radius one. When Z equals two, you have a circle of radius two. And so this idea just keeps building on itself. Now, if you slice in the xy plane, you'll notice that the sides of this are straight. There it goes straight up, right? And that gives you the top part of the cone. But of course, your z squared, your z on the inside can be positive or negative and you square it. So the same idea, if your z was negative one, you would still get a circle of radius one. And so it opens down the bottom as well. And you can just make a note that if you just had z equals the square root of x squared plus y squared, that's the top part. As opposed to having z squared equals x squared plus y squared, that's both the top and the bottom. And that, that's how we get this guy here, going back up to the table. Okay, so that is a cone. E, F, G, where's the other guy? H, so look at this one. All right, so what do you think that guy is? Uh, wait, so do we prove that we know what is using traces or is the sketch if we can do it straight away in 3D? Not to get us full credit for a question. No, if you go straight to the 3D sketch, I wouldn't mind. 
Yeah. Doing the traces is very helpful though. So the traces is really like your training reels. It's, it's almost like a crutch, but definitely by Calc 3, someone will expect you to know how to draw a cone without having to go through all these traces. So the quicker you can do that, the, the better. Um, but yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so let's go through these guys here. Uh, X squared plus Y squared minus Z squared equals one. So let's look at the traces for this guy. And we would have say, say Z equals zero. So we're in the X, Y plane. This will be X squared plus Y squared equals one. That is a circle. Say so x equals zero. This is y squared minus z squared equals one. That is a hyperbola and it opens in the y direction. Uh, one and minus one. Now again, you're confused about hyperbolas in which direction they open, go back to the conic sections lecture. Uh, if we plug in say y equals zero, you would get x squared minus z squared equals one. And that is also a hyperbola. This one opens along the x. So now I go in and I, I wanna do my sketch. So now, you know, there's a circle of radius one in the X, Y plane. And attached to that, there are these hyperbolas. So let's, let's actually make these guys different colors. Let's make that one green, green, green. Let's make this one blue. Blue. So there's gonna be a green one that is in the Y, Z plane. So that's gonna to be touching here and going up. It's gonna be like hyperbolas being wide like that. These touch along the Y axis. So the Y axis is passing through the intersection point. Okay, then we have the blues along the X. These are also hyperbolas and they open towards the X. So these are well, here and here. And of course, you just put these guys all together. It's like a bunch of hyperbolas with a little belt holding them together. And you have the hyperboloid of one sheet. That's how you put that guy together. Now, of course, the last one, this is going to give you the hyperboloid of two sheets. Final example in this section. Any big difference between what? Oh yeah, there's a huge difference. So the hyperbola of two sheets has a big gap in the middle, which we'll, we'll figure out here. Uh, so here, if I look at traces, say uh, x equals zero. Now here we get minus y squared minus z squared equals one, which you now you know has no solution. Right, so that, that automatically tells you there's a gap here. You're automatically seeing, noticing something strange. Now, uh, you go to like uh, y equals zero, you would get x squared minus z, z squared equals one. That is a hyperbola opening on the x. If you go to x equals zero, uh, we already did x equals zero. I mean, z equals zero. Now, 
you would get uh, x squared minus y squared equals one. And again, that's a hyperbola opening on the x. This is a y. There, y equals zero. This should be a z. Force of habit. Right? So there's nothing in the yz plane, but in the xy plane uh, and, the, and the xz plane, things are happening. So that means that the curve, the, the surface that you're looking at doesn't actually pass through the yz. So now when you're putting together the sketch, now let's do this one green. Now, when you're putting together the sketch, this will go on here, this will go on here, this will go on here. All right, so the red curve, this is in the XZ plane, and it's opening along the X. So you'll have a curve like that. Boom, and a curve like that, boom. And then you go in the x, y plane and you have a green curve. Again, it's a hyperbola and it's actually starting around the x on the same part. So you'll have that. And now you kind of uh, try to put those two together, kind of whirl them around in sort of a 3D shape and you'll realize that you have kind of like a, a paraboloid on, on here, but it, ex, it extends like a hyperbola, not like a parabola. They, they do have different ways of being extended. This one actually moves along some asymptote somewhere. Right, but it extends, it, so it's two separate pieces. Oh, how do I know it won't go through the YZ? Because of this equation here. In the YZ, this is when X equals zero, my equation says minus Y squared minus Z squared must be equal to one. Um, there are no real values of Y and Z that I can pick that would satisfy that equation. The moment my Y and Z are non-zero, the left side is negative. So it'll, it, it'll never be a positive one. And if I make both of them zero, then the left side would be zero. Again, it's never, I can't get the two sides of this equation to be equal. And so I know in the yz, there is no graph, right? Um, because it'll have complex solutions, but it's not going to have any real solution. It won't be something that I can see in the real thing. Yeah. So that's how I know it's not going to touch the, it's not going to touch this plane right here. So there's a gap. So this graph goes in two parts and they're separated. So there's a very big difference between the hyperboloid of one sheet and the hyperboloid of two sheets. Now, so the hyperboloid of one sheet, you'll have two traces that are hyperbolas and one trace that's a circle. The hyperboloid of two sheets, you have two traces that's a hyperbola and there is no third trace, which kind of tells you, oh, there's a gap. And so if you go back here to the original table, um, you can see that again, uh, just kind of situate this here. So in this one, hyperbola of one sheet, you realize if you set y equals zero, you get a hyperbola. Set x equals zero, you get a hyperbola. Uh, set z equals zero, you get a circle. However, in the second one down here, if you set x equals zero, you get a hyperbola. Set y equals zero, you get a hyperbola. But if you get set z equals zero, you get an impossible equation. So there's literally a gap here. It splits this guy in two. And uh, that's, that's it, that's, that's sketching. So that, that's pretty much all you need, need to know to sketch for this course, cylinders and quadric surfaces. And I've pretty much taught you how to sketch all six of them. Um, and cylinders are their whole other beast. Technically there's an infinite variety of them, but of course there are some common ones, circular cylinders, parabolic cylinders usually show up, um, elliptic cylinders, hyper, Hyper, hyperbolic cylinders don't 
uh, show up that often, but if it, if it does come up in a matching question, you should be able to match it to itself. So that's the sketching thing. Now, that being said, I think there's one other, yeah. So that being said, we have three more sections to get through in this class. So um, in general, I don't know, one, one of these sections might be a, a couple lectures, but so I'm looking for about in two weeks from now, so that two weeks worth of classes and we'll finish everything, which might leave us with a day or so to review, uh, assuming that I don't take up the test. So, so that, that'll be good. So as always, I'll post a PDF of this, but that's pretty much all I wanted to do for today. Just get you guys uh, used to sketching and the, the strategies that you would go through. And there are really two main strategies. Uh, for the cylinders, you sketch the generating curve, stretch it along an axis. And for the uh, quadric surfaces, you draw traces. You draw several. Uh, you might have to tweak things a little bit. You start by plugging in x equals 0, y equals 0, z equals 0. But if those don't give you anything useful, plug in some other constants, x equals 1, z equals 1, y equals something else. Um, but you draw enough, sketch enough points of view to have, uh, to have these things done. So. Uh, that's this topic. That's what I had planned for today. I already wrote the notes for the future topics, which are pretty cool, but I, I won't go into them. I mean, it's already a Friday. It's already an extra class. I'm not going to push. I'm not going to push my luck here. No. So officially we'll kind of end there. Now, if there are people who want to hand back a little bit and talk about the test, I can do that for a few minutes. Um, but what, I, what I'll probably do is just end this video recording and then start a whole new recording and post that as like a, a Q&A slash review session. So if, if you guys want to, if, if there's anyone who wants to stick around and ask me questions, uh, we can do that. So the second test is the last day of class. So it'll be the last Thursday you're in class for the RS2 section. And it'll be the last Wednesday you're in class for the GH section. And if all goes according to plan, I should finish all the topics by the Monday and Tuesday of that week, respectively. So if I have an extra class that week end, it'll more be like a review kind of thing, I guess, or something similar. Yeah. You should be able to access the old homework uh, without me opening anything. You just won't get credit for it. If you're unable to actually see the homework, I would say go to uh, customer support because that's something wrong that's not on my end. But you, sh you should be able to see uh, old, old homeworks. Yeah, Kevin, don't, don't forget about the homework. I, I don't think they're due yet. All the homeworks that have been open since chapter 12, they're all like, uh, they're all like due at the last day of class. So from chapter 12 and chapter 14, all homeworks are due the last day. I, I set it up that way, I think. So you got it. So, but anything for chapter 11 or earlier, those are already closed and I'm, I'm not gonna open them up. But you should be able to go in and see them. If you're if you can't do that, that's that's not on my end. So I would just uh, shout out to customer service at Cengage and tell them to give you access. Okay. All right, so that's it I want to do for today. Just uh, talk about um, sketching. So now you know how to sketch stuff. Uh, we're going to be talking about functions in higher dimensions. Then we're going to talk about limits and continuity in higher dimensions. Then we're going to talk about differentiation in higher dimensions. And th that is called partial derivative. One aspect of differentiation in higher dimensions. You're not going to learn about com a complete theory of differentiation until you're in like advanced calculus or something like that. That's math 323 for you math majors or a real analysis course. 
Um, but we'll, we'll learn a very useful aspect of differentiation called partial differentiation. Still very useful if you're an applied mathematician or an engineer or any of that stuff. It's still very important stuff to learn. But the total picture of what differentiation looks like in multiple dimensions, that is for another time because you will need to know a lot of linear algebra to actually understand any of the theory. Um, because it, it's using a lot of vectors and throwing vectors inside of matrices and then you have to understand what that all means. It's really uh, uh, heavy stuff. Okay. <laughs> I don't know, in one sense, I wouldn't worry too much about the final. Uh, in one sense, it's hard in the sense that it's just new. It'll be definitely an unprecedented final. We've never had a final like this in the history of City College, as far as I know. Um, but I don't think they can ask very hard problems either, because it has to be something that a computer can grade. So I'm thinking it's going to be a combination of short answers and multiple choice. And so you might be able to, through process of elimination, kind of figure things out if you're not 100% technical on everything. So there is hope. I, I wouldn't say the final is a lost cause. So again, don't freak out or get down on yourself. You never actually want to do that. You always want to keep your head in the game, just understand. Come up with a plan and execute. And then you tweak the plan and execute again. Then you tweak the plan and execute. Don't waste your time, oh my God, worrying. Um, Give yourself some time to worry and then actually come up with a plan and execute the plan and it should be fine. Um, yeah, so I'm going to officially end this lecture right now, but I will stick around for any Q&A or anything you want to ask me about the test or anything like that. So um, let me uh, stop the recording here. Bye, everybody.